Hey, Andrew. Welcome, everybody, to the third SWAG meeting of this year. Thank you all for coming. Um, we have a pretty packed agenda, so what we'll start with is we'll do some introductions of everybody in the room. Um, so I'll I'll go ahead and start, and um, we have a new SWAG member who's joining us tonight, uh, Jim Hewitt. We're really excited that he had interest in being on the SWAG, and thank you to the City Council for appointing him. And so I'll we'll start and we'll go to the left and we'll let Jim go last and he can just share a little bit about himself and why he wanted to join the SWAG. So my name's Andrea Miko. I'm a Portsmouth resident and I co-chair the SWAG with Brian. Uh, I'm McQuillan, fire chief and uh, Portsmouth resident. Stephanie Secord, public information officer and scribe for the meeting. Thank you, Stephanie. Brian Gads, director of water, city of Portsmouth. It's the body of city councilor. Al Pratt, water resource manager for the city. Patrick Hillman, city resident. Kim McNamara, director of the health department. Brandon Kernan, the administrator of the Drinking Water and Groundwater Bureau at DES. Dave Muse, state representative. Yes, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jim Hewitt. And uh, as Andrea said earlier, um, I expressed an interest and in, uh, to be on SWAG, and I have uh, lived in Portsmouth on and off for 30 years, and uh, I think I've sent some concerns of mine to SWAG over the years, and uh, so Andrea reached out to me and asked if I'd be interested to join. I said, uh, sure, I'd love to I'd love to help out, and uh, I'm a planning board member and uh, have a, a decent uh, professional background in water resources. So uh, I hope to help out uh, the city with their water issues. Well, thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, and I think we'll turn it over to the folks that are with us online. Um, is it just Amy right now? Yeah. Ryan? We, we, okay. So we'll kind of, we'll yeah, hold uh, off because we'll introduce her, I guess, in a moment. If we, we, yeah. If we see some uh, swag members on the attendees, we'll promote them to. Okay. And now we have. Uh, Elizabeth Barrett has her hand raised. She's oh, oh okay, yep. She now, so you have to make her. Uh, I will promote the panelists, and then she'll be able to talk. Liz, are you there? No, oh, there you are. Yeah, I just I was having an issue being promoted to panelists, but I just wanted to introduce myself as well. I'm Elizabeth Barrett. I'm on the school board and. So I'm the member of the school board on the SWAG committee. So nice to meet you. Thanks, Liz. Yeah. All right. And there's Laurel and promote her. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they're all they're all trickling in here. Laurel, you should be able to, as soon as we see you, you should be able to say hello. Hi everyone. Good to see you all. Great, great. Hey, Laurel. Uh, let me double check. Attendees. Anna Linder. Nope, she's not. Okay, and I don't know the phone number, so I do not know if that is a... I, okay. I can briefly allow <laughs> whoever is 603 440 Nine four seven four. I'll allow allow you to talk, and maybe you can say who you are. All right. All right. We'll give you a minute or two. Okay. No, they're muted. Okay. Well, um, whoever's on the phone can listen. Um, this meeting is being recorded, so it will be up on the city's website for people to review or possible people that that aren't um, able to uh, to attend uh, this meeting. Um, we do have a full agenda. I'm gonna pull the agenda up for Andrea, but um, we'd like to ask everybody with given as much as we have on the agenda that when we have presentations, we kind of hold our questions until um, the end because it we might not get through everything if we, um, you know, if we, interrupt the presentation. So mm -hmm. I'll turn it back over to Andrea. Okay, great. 
Yeah. So here, here's our agenda for tonight. It is pretty packed and we're happy to have a guest speaker with us today too from New Hampshire DES. But um, before we get started, one other thing that we need to do is approve our minutes from the June meeting. So I circulated a link that had the draft minutes and we just need a motion to um, approve the minutes. Does anyone have a motion? I'll move we uh, uh, approve the meeting minutes of the previous meeting of the SWAC. Wait a second. Second. Okay. Any, is everybody in favor of that? Anyone opposed to that? Okay. Meeting minutes approved. Okay, great. Um, so now we will uh, turn the presentation over to Amy Hudner. She is the private well coordinator from New Hampshire DES Drinking Water and Groundwater Bureau. Um, and she has prepared a presentation for us tonight. And also we have Brandon Kernan from New Hampshire DES here as well. And so thank you very much, Amy. We look forward to hearing from you. Yes, so go ahead and introduce yourself briefly, Amy, and then I'll pull up uh, your presentation. Yeah, sounds good. Hi, I'm Amy Hudnor. I'm with uh, New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, Drinking Water and Groundwater Bureau, and um, a, the Private Well Coordinator. Okay. Let me uh, bring up your presentation. Where to go? There it is. Share. And just so I know, so are there some folks that can't that can't see the presentation? that can only hear me and not um well in good on zoom yeah in person we can see it and on zoom it should be visible oh okay 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 do you do you see it could, could could you go back to the very first go backward a couple there go. we go okay perfect <laughs> thanks <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to talk about the Seacoast Private Well Initiative, which is a project that was uh, started by the Seacoast Commission on Drinking Water and is funded uh, by the Drinking Water and Groundwater Trust Fund. Next slide. So the basics of the program are that it covers this, these 12 seacoast towns, and uh, these are the towns represented by the Seacoast Drinking Water Commission. And the bones of it are that um, we have a workshop and well testing, free well testing for all, any private well user in, in these towns. Um, so we have divided the 12 towns into six regions for workshops, for the purpose of workshops and, and organizing the well testing. Um, and we, at the workshop, we talk about the, the common New Hampshire well water contaminants, their possible health impacts, and also water treatment options. And then we work, use the workshops as the opportunity to hand out test kits to folks. Uh, the water testing, then they have to collect their own water samples and bring them back on a certain date um, to a certain location, which is we've been using like mostly the town offices, I think exclusively town offices, actually. Um, and we include what we call the standard analysis, um, which includes things like arsenic, copper, manganese, lead. Uh, we also include radon and we include four PFAS that have New Hampshire health limits. And then after folks have collected their samples, brought them at the correct time and location, and the labs have processed them, we send folks their results. And we also send them what we call a Be Well Informed report, which tells them possible health impacts of any contaminants found, um, and also treatment recommendations. And of course, our contact info um, if they need further help. And those with a PFAS exceedance are encouraged to apply for the PFAS treatment rebate, which uh, is funding for, for private well owners that have PFAS. Next slide. So these are our, um, actually we're a little farther along than what I'm showing in this slide, <laughs> but the ones in green are towns we've already covered so far. Um, we have had a total of 467 households that have submitted water samples. Hey, and do you see in the right slide right now? I'm sorry, what? Do you, which slide are you seeing? I'm just making sure technology is 
Oh, oh uh, with the the green, the green, the map with the green and the blue of the different towns. Great. Okay. Just, so, okay. <laughs> not, not at the right one. All right. Um, yeah. So this shows you the number of households that have participated per town. Um, so far, Stratum has been the town that we've done in this region or that we will be doing in this region that has the highest number of private wells. So it, we kind of expected that one to be the biggest workshop. Um, and then we've also had Madbury and Exeter and Northampton be combined into one workshop for, for both those towns. Um, so we got participants from both. And we've been landing around this percentage of about 12% of the private well households in each town have participated. Not exactly 12% for each town. It's been somewhere between like 10 and 13% for, for our um, participation. Next slide. So this shows Stratum, which is kind of our powerhouse region there because they've got so many private wells. Um, so we had a good turnout with uh, that workshop, about, about 300 people attended. And um, so on the right, you see uh, we've got these tables set up um, so that after the workshop, as we let people out of the workshop, we have them go to these tables that are set up with the sample kits and um, they get to choose between different dates of when they're when they're going to commit to collecting their samples in the morning and taking them to to the town office. So they get a choice of of dates of when they um, want to bring them back. So next slide. So just uh, talking a little bit about arsenic because uh, spoiler is that uh, we found we find more arsenic than anything else. Um, so arsenic, uh, this is just showing a sort of a geology map on the on the right here that um, where the darker colors indicate uh, higher probability of having arsenic in the geology above uh, five parts per billion, which is New Hampshire's uh, limit for public water systems. Next slide. Um, yeah, so arsenic, and you likely many of you already sort of know this uh, information uh, focusing on water in New Hampshire with arsenic, but um, just a quick summary is that uh, over five parts per billion of arsenic, especially if consumed, consuming that water, a lot of it over a long period of time can increase risk, health risks, um, certain types of cancer. Um, bladder cancer in particular um, for pregnant moms and infants, um, it can uh, potentially uh, increase the risk of a kind of a lower birth weight and um, lower you know, IQ and brain development of the infant. Um, so it can have some um, pretty serious health consequences if drank in you know, higher quantities over time. Next slide. Next slide, please. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so in this project so far, um, kind of as we expected, unfortunately, um, finding some, some arsenic. Um, so these pie charts show you of each town that we've covered so far, um, the orangey color is the percentage of the participants that have, you know, the percentage that were above the five parts per billion health standard for New Hampshire. Um, and that totaled up to be 206 households um, that had arsenic above five parts per billion. So those folks, you know, obviously got their results and were notified and were given uh, recommendations of treatment options on how to remove arsenic from their water. Next slide. So part of the project is also that for low income households um, that have certain contaminants above health limits, we're providing these free uh, zero water pitchers. Uh, zero water pitchers are, are one of the few pitchers on the market that um, will remove arsenic and they also remove a lot of things that are you know fairly common for a private well owner. Um, I think manganese they remove and uh, PFOA and PFOS and just a, a very um, tailored picture for, for those that are, you know, are not on a public water system and may have um, you know, certain things in their water. So 16 have received these free pitchers. 
Next slide. And then for folks that have, uh, we identified 19 households with at least one PFAS above the health limit, and we um, referred those folks over to our PFAS treatment rebate for private well owners. Um, if you have an exceedance of one of the four PFAS, you're uh, you know, most likely qualified for this up to $5,000 for a treatment system or uh, up to $10,000 if you can connect to a public water system. So those folks were referred to that program. Next slide. So we're sending surveys to everybody who's participated and we send these surveys about two months after they got their results. Um, and so one of the questions, I mean, they're pretty lengthy surveys, but one of the questions that we asked was about knowledge of private well water contaminants. Um, and these are the answers folks gave. Most people said it they increased uh, their knowledge. Um, some said it significantly increased. Um, and a few you know, said not increased at all. So next slide. Um, this is an interesting question on the survey um, about two months after they've gotten their results. Uh, for those of them that answered that they did have health limits above, I'm sorry, contaminants above the health limits, we asked, you know, what actions have you taken? Um, so the higher bars are, you know, we like to see over there on the left, in, they installed or in the, the process of installing a new water treatment system. Um, some haven't taken action taken action yet, but they plan to. Uh, some started using a filter pitcher. Uh, some are still researching, still deciding. And if some folks are reviewing the maintenance requirements of their existing water treatment system. And for those folks, um, you know, it may be that, you know, so we, we asked folks to take their samples or suggested they should take their samples at the kitchen sink. And if they had a treatment system to just keep it running, um, you know, because you do sometimes get this knowledge if you take uh, your sample of your treated water that, you know, perhaps it's not moving, removing what you thought it was, or maybe you're not, you know, replacing filters often enough. Um, so for some folks, that seemed to be the case. Um, and then about uh, 15 said they haven't taken any action and don't plan to. Next slide. So we had the um, the fourth workshop uh, last week. It was in Hampton and Seabrook, which Seabrook doesn't really have too many private wells. So we had uh, everyone show up that was from Hampton. Um, and then we're in the midst of uh, water sample collection. I just picked up a, a batch this morning. Um, and then we have two more regions to cover and uh, should be wrapped up by about May. Um, of next year. And can open it up to questions. Share. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. That was uh, helpful. I, I I would start. It's got dark on me, so I'm going to open the curtain. <laughs> All right, we can see you. Um, so Portsmouth is on the list. And uh, when, when might we... Uh, Expect that round to occur. We know we're we're not aware of too many wells in Portsmouth, but we want to be able to get the word out um, if that comes here. And it's yes, uh, Portsmouth and Greenland, or what? Who? What? What would the be that? Yes. Yeah, so the um, our next region, um, and we're going to start advertising soon. Is going to be Greenland, Portsmouth, Rye, and Newington. So in that in that group. Greenland has by far the most private wells. Then I think that may be followed by Newington, then Rye, then Portsmouth. So we'll we'll be um, I'll touch base with you. Where we've scheduled it, uh, we just scheduled it. So and I haven't pulled together any promotional materials yet, but it's going to be um, November fifteenth at the Greenland Central School, I think it's called. Um, but yeah, I'll definitely send you the flyers and. Um, so you can help get the word out. So we have contacts because you know we we serve most of Greenland, we serve most of Newington, but they're you know the private wells um, in both those. Mm. Um, same with Rye, we we do serve some water uh, to Rye Water District, but the Bay too have that. So yeah, we 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 can help with 
with that. That's great, great to hear, and we'll certainly um, try to get the word out to Portsmouth too. Yeah. Amy, so five thousand dollars that is offered for rebates for a treatment system cover the complete cost of a treatment system. Uh, for the for the PFAS, yeah. So my understanding that is that it typically does. If someone has a a whole house treatment system for PFAS, that it would cover that, or it can cover multiple um, point of use systems, reverse osmosis systems. Thank you, Council Lombardi. Uh, yeah. Do we have any sense of Do we have any sense of how many wells, private wells, there are in Portsmouth? Um. So if you uh, I don't have it memorized, but Brian, do you do you yes. have that? It's on one of those slides. Otter's in the low double digit. I mean, like maybe yeah. eighty or a hundred. Out right, but there are estimates out there. I'd have to go track it down. I think her slide said hundred and two for Portsmouth, and that's residents. So you you figure two point five divided by two point five, so forty or. 50. But, you know, it might be good to touch base with you, Brian, if you have any sort of a well, data, well I, database of addresses we can look well, at because. Happened. Yeah, I'm sorry. My, my thinking is likely maybe a lot on the list are actually irrigation wells. So what we can do is your list, we can match up with our customer database. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they happen to be a customer as well, they likely have an irrigation well so you know what we what we generally do and this always comes up during droughts because you will have a number of uh, places in the city that'll say you know i don't have to go in restrictions because i have a private well and we actually send staff out to confirm that and when they do confirm they also have to make sure that there is no connection of that well physically to our pipes um so um, we can we can check. So if you send your list, we'll we'll check it against our customers and you can do follow up that way too. Okay, yeah, because one thing we do is send a postcard to the private well households, and so I you get a mailing list. But you know, it's it's not going to be a hundred percent accurate, but <laughs> we do it the best we can, just so that um, you know, especially in a town where, um, like at Hampton. I think we figured out only about 5% of Hampton is on private wells and we had uh, postcard mailings to them, you know, because they may not hear, I mean, it's harder to reach, I think it's harder to reach folks in towns where the make up a small percentage of the, of the, um, the private well owners make up a small percentage, it's a little hard um, to reach them through, you know, the social media and the town emails and that sort of thing, so. Uh, yeah, the follow-up is um, arsenic only a problem with drinking it, or I know there are some things that are a problem for showering as well. Um, so I don't know, is arsenic a, a problem other than drinking it? Yeah, my understanding of it is that's it for drinking, for consumption. And for um, yeah, and then things like uh, radon would be something that would be an issue in showering because it's releasing um, it, it, radon as a gas is being released as you run the water. Um, but arsenic, my understanding is a uh, it's drinking water, you know, consuming, and it, it's also in some foods. Um, arsenic is is in some foods as well. Follow up to that is a question of um, if people have it for irrigation, are they are they irrigating uh, gardens, uh, vegetable gardens, and things like that? And is that a problem? Yeah. I'm not really sure about for arsenic. Um, does anyone in the room know? Or I don't think there's great data for water. It's usually soils, like a lot of rice from Asia is highly yeah. contaminated because the arsenic's in the soil. Um, I don't think the really have the data on arsenic levels in our water, what it means to its level in produce. That type of work's being done by John Batali for PFAS right now, but not mm -hmm. arsenic. Right. I would- Historically, one... that arsenic in orchards has led to yes. poisoning, but again, that's been from a soil, using soil as the primary medium, not necessarily drinking water. Um, so, so this, this this program, you know, happened through 
the Drinking Water Commission, which you know Brandon and I are on, and I've got to say it's it's like one of the best things I've ever seen the state be able to do. I was on the Groundwater Commission for a number of years with with Brandon, and we suggested a lot of a lot of initiatives, but there was no money. And fortunately, there's money available now through the ARPA monies and some of the Fed monies and the Groundwater Trust monies. I think that's what funded this one, right, Brandon? So um, it's it's great that you know we can we can do this and, and get the word out. I mean the the percentage is fairly high, especially for arsenic. Um, and I pointed out when when Amy made this presentation to the Drinking Water Commission that every one of those wells, if they were a source of our water, we'd be in violation. We'd have to tell people and take measures to to treat. Fortunately, arsenic. Al's going to corroborate when I say <laughs> it's not not. Uh, an issue with our sources right. so we're fortunate in that respect um so you know it's it, it is a it is a great program i'll be able to nice to be able to ad advertise that when you know it comes and available for portsmouth mm -hmm. laurel's got her hand up yeah no thanks for that presentation and really great that you do that follow-up survey and see what actions people take in the long term I was curious for the be well informed tool. Do you have questions specifically about the format of that, and maybe do you have any specific feedback that you've gotten about that that tool, which I've seen and seems really helpful? But we're always interested in you know ways to improve report back. So just curious about your evaluation of that tool. Oh, you mean when we sell, send our surveys, do we ask them about that, or yeah. or have yeah. you done other kind of evaluation of the tool beyond just this program? Oh yeah, um, we don't we don't ask that specifically on the survey for this project, um, but Be Well Informed does have a survey associated with it. When you, as a member of the public, you go in and you enter enter your water test results, um, it asks you to fill out a survey if or if you'd like to. And I, I actually haven't seen those survey results, so I'm not sure. But anecdotally, if, you know, we get we get good good feedback about it, you know, mainly because, you know, the water test results are very complex and I mean, it's a complex topic in general. So, um, you know, you, you get in there and you type everything in and it gives you, you know, pretty easy to read and understand, um, you know, the health effects and the, and the treatment options. So, yeah, I haven't seen the surveys though about Be Well Informed. I don't know if Brandon's seen those. Do you know Brandon or he's reached? Be well informed reports. You know, the uh the surveys that uh be well informed like asks you if you want to fill out a survey when you enter your results. I haven't seen those um, the okay. project. Okay. Um, yeah. First of all, I just want to make sure re re identify yourself, I guess, Brandon. All right, so. Brandon Kernan with the Department of Environmental Services. Mm -hmm. First of all, I just want to point out there's a lot more PFAS data for each of these towns. Amy just presented data from this initiative. The, the data from this initiative all is feeding into the PFAS viewer map online, too. And there's many more residential wells that have been sampled as part of um, contamination site or general like aquarium paid for 80 samples in their well protection areas to be sampled. So there's many more PFAS samples to add to the general statistics town by town. And again, all the data is in one place on our viewer online, including Amy's project. The other thing I wanted to point out is that um, is when the trust fund funded this, at the time Senator, Senator Morris was the chairperson, and he very much wanted this to be a pilot project and that we develop a report and make a recommendation to the legislature for funding this on a permanent basis statewide. So much money goes to public water systems, federal dollars, state dollars, a very disproportionate amount goes to private wells. So at the end of this, we will be writing a report and making recommendations to the legislature or to the trust fund to then make recommendations to the legislature to fund this out of the state budget, opposed to the trust fund, which is not always going to be around, um, possibly. The other thing I was going to bring up is with the rebate. I think there's some real important messaging with it. The P rebate for treatment is for PFAS, but the treatment for PFAS doesn't treat for arsenic. And so our concern is people are going to get the rebate, put a whole house carbon unit in, have a state paid treatment system that's only removing one of the things that's mm -hmm. concerned. And that 
you know, it's really important that people look at point of use that can do arsenic or AMP fast or pay the extra for a whole house arsenic treatment or other contaminant. Um, so I, I think that's something that we need to keep messaging. And the last thing is kind of a, a weird situation. So in one town, Madbury, um, this contaminant's not part of our standard list for this project. It's part of public water system sampling. But um, the lab, when they looked at metals, they're reporting what we ask them to and what we pay them to, but they can kind of see if there's other things going on with other metals. And if there is, they can go ahead and look for them, put the extra effort in. And they noticed antimony um, in a cluster of wells in Madbury, like four wells, um, MCL is six parts per billion. Um, those homes had 300 parts per billion. I've been in this profession for 30 years at the state for 24 years, and I have one antimony um, experience, and that was with a plumbing issue with a slight exceedance. These are very unusual levels. So we're doing a sub project where we're sampling about 30 more wells and resampling the ones that were high to try seeing what's going on. It does look like it's very localized because we went back to the lab and said, go ahead and look for antimony and all the other samples. And it's all non-detect except in this cluster, <laughs> um, but very odd um, result. Does that come from bedrock? You know, in other parts of the country, it could be, but it, we don't really see it in New Hampshire at, ever, really. Um, it's hardly ever detected. And when you research the literature, even at antimony mines, the groundwater contamination isn't that high. So it's it's really an odd, odd result. Um, it could be uh, something very site specific, ge geologically speaking, but it could be some historic activity too. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we don't know at this point. So we're doing extra sampling to help characterize the geochemistry to help figure that out to see if there's more investigations that need to be done on, the, on those properties. Thank you. Um, I have a question about, so we know the EPA has proposed some MCLs for PFAS that are much lower than New Hampshire standards. They're not final yet, but um, are you forewarning homeowners if you see um, a PFOA or PFOS level that would exceed the EPA's proposed MCL? And, you know, are you intervening in those homes like proactively or you can't, but, you know, how are you handling that given the New Hampshire levels are different than what EPA is proposing? The way we've historically handled it is to go back to our databases when the standard changed and let people know um, the message is different now because people have letters saying you meet standard or don't meet standard. Okay. And it's a touch a few buttons. We can generate letters to a, a new set of people based on their results. So I think we're going to, we've been waiting. I mean, certainly in our, not in this presentation, but in our general presentation about PFAS, we do show the occurrence above four parts per trillion, and it will more than double the number of wells that exceed statewide. Okay. And I am hearing they're going to come out with the final value in December, and okay. I think low. That's what I've been told. Okay. All right. Well, so, but I guess to be clear, you're not warning anybody now. You're going to wait until they're final and then recontact anyone that's exceeding. That would be our standard approach, yes. Okay. All right, thanks. Sure. Go ahead. Hi, this is Jim Hewitt. And um, can you confirm that arsenic is typically just a bedrock groundwater problem and it's rarely seen in surface and uh, overburden deposits? Yes, that's, uh, that, that's oh, accurate. Um, okay. We have some overburden wells that are getting recharged from the bedrock that have arsenic in it. And then there's one place in the state I know of high arsenic in sand and gravel but generally speaking, it's bedrock wells. And it can depend on the type of bedrock well. Bedrock wells drilled before the 80s were drilled with old technology. They weren't sealed into, the casing wasn't sealed into rock. And so you have a lot of overburdened groundwater falling into the borehole. And so the levels are low. These are newer wells, which are really sealed into rock to keep bacteria out. That, that's where we see the higher arsenic. So it's something to think about our well construction standards. You know, while preventing bacteria, we're increasing arsenic. Mm -hmm. And so it's a discussion that needs to be had. Right. So that, that kind of explains why Portsmouth Municipal System doesn't have an arsenic problem because majority of our water is surface and or from overburden wells. I think uh, Seabrook's the only major seacoast town with bedrock wells, I think. Rye has a couple. Yeah. Hampton. Hampton. Northampton. 
Um, I had one other question. Why is participation so low? I think your slide said 12% of public uh, private well owners participated. Do you have a sense of why more people aren't participating? Especially if it's free? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, we do our best to get the word out, but I'm sure, you know, we're probably not reaching everybody in the sense that we, we send postcards to the private well households, um, but, you know, not everybody checks their mail. Um, uh, we use social media, town sends, town send out emails, we put up flyers, um, but, you know, there are a number of reasons that people might not want to test their well and might not want to participate in a, you know, government run testing program. Um, they might be worried, you know, they don't want the government to have their water quality data or um, it becomes, you know, potentially public information. Um, you know, some some people don't wanna know what's in their water. Um, maybe they've already tested their water. Uh, you know, it could be a variety of reasons. They don't, they don't, uh, they don't know, they don't think they're going to know what to do if they find contaminants or they won't be able to afford it, uh, that type of thing. Um, there's lots of, or, or just, you know, kind of a, a not, not a belief that, um, you know, well water could be, there could be harmful things in it. Um, those are some of the things that I've, you know, heard anecdotally. And also there's some, there's some research and some scientific literature, social science, uh, literature on, um, you know, private well testing and barriers and things like that. And those are some of the things that I've that I've read and and heard. Thank you. I, sure. off, I, I probably have coordinated more private well testing efforts than anybody in New Hampshire going back to two thousand. And you know, my experience is you send letters, you get a twenty percent rate. You send more letters, you get another twenty percent. When you go and ask people and talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, it's almost 98% that you get it. It's this general blasting of information at people. It's just it's bouncing off of them at this point. But when you lock eyes and talk to them one-on-one -on -one or write a personal email that they know is not coming from a computer-generated thing, but connecting something personally to them, you, you have a very high success rate. But this general information blast has this kind of results. Well, and at the, at the last... Drinking Water Commission meeting, I asked Amy this question, like, you know, especially Stratum. Stratum had the highest, you know, number of, of wells over the arsenic and stuff. And I, I asked whether people, you know, found out, you know, like a neighbor and then wanted to to sample. And and Amy, you did say, yeah, they, I mean, that happened. So like, you know, word of mouth. So, you know, if I live in a neighborhood and all the wells were drilled at the same time, and I found out from my neighbor that they had high arsenic, I would really think that implies the same. And I would, I would think that, right, Amy, that, you know, you have had people follow up. And I guess there was some question whether we, you know, that it'd come back around or whatever. Yeah. So one thing that I've been doing um, is we get folks register. We ask them to register by just sending me an email. <laughs> so, so then I ha end up with this email list and, um, about a week before the workshop, I emailed everybody that's registered so far, and I've sort of put out a plug to could you could you let your neighbors know about this? <laughs> you know? And I, you know, just say a few things like, you know, we really know that neighbors telling neighbors is a good way to spread, um, you know, increase well testing, and also I, you know, a little bit about, you know, you, do you know anyone who's planning a family or you know young young children or infants? Um, might want to, you know, mention it to them specifically. And so I don't, you know, I don't know. I think that does bring in a few extras because I, you know, we ask them on the forms, we have them fill out when they show up, you know, how did you hear about it? And some people do say they heard about it from their neighbors. So, but yeah, I think after, after the testing's over, I imagine people are telling their neighbors about it, especially for the things like arsenic that are, you know, naturally occurring in the, in the groundwater. Um, probably spreading the word at that point you know the the free testing program is over but um hopefully there's some you know further communication that's happening between neighbors um just about you know testing on your own or making sure you you do this wait i'm sorry i have one more question um where what is the source of pfas in these towns 
where you said you've had to intervene at some homes or provide the rebates? Was there a specific source, like a, I think in Stratum, there may have been a fire station or something? I don't, you know, I'm just curious if there's been a pattern of sources. Yeah, so once this project, it, we get the results from this project, we um, we turn that data over to a team that um, is in the waste division that I don't know too well. I'm not too connected. Uh, Brandon works with them a lot more than I do, so I'm not sure um, specifically, they haven't circled back to me and said, by the way, you know, this is what we found is the source. I mean, I know the Stratum Fire Department had been already identified pro way prior to this project um, uh, in that town, but I'm not sure specifically. Um, have you heard anything, Brandon, or? Well, our waste division certainly looks to see historic land uses, historic waste sites, to see if there's an obvious responsible party. I think to a large degree, we looked for those sites well before this effort. And so, you know, we have the landfills, we have the car wash area, we have, you know, other areas kind of already mapped out. So I think what we're seeing is a lot of domestic sources of of PFAS, and that could be the imported loam that has sludge from wastewater plant in it. Yeah, that's a common way to make topsoil. It could be cleaners that have been used on cars in a given area next to the well on a regular basis. It could be detergents that we certainly see PFAS in from Jen Hartman's work. So there, there's a lot of domestic sources um, of PFAS, and that's why we don't see big plumes in these neighborhoods unless you have onesie twosies kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. So, and I do, I will add that um, once they are kind of entered into our system, um, the the DES sampling team, which is a kind of another sampling program, but um, they do, they put them in their system where they notify um, anyone within 500 feet um, and offer them to sample their well. So um, there is a, kind of this extra sampling that happens for, or at least neighbors are invited uh, um, through a sampling program where DES goes out into the home and takes takes the samples. Um, well, Laurel, did are you seeing the screen where I put the chat up? Yes. Um, so Dr. Shader mentioned, and I don't know if this is going out to everybody when I put the chat up. Um, there is was this Columbia University study. That basically, yeah, neighbors telling neighbors <laughs> make them uh, more interested in in their water quality. So, thank you. It was, yeah, sure. It was, it was not so much neighbors telling neighbors. It was if there was a well that was discovered to have high arsenic that that then the people running the study would notify people in that neighborhood. They were looking at different factors to motivate people to get their well tested, and the most effective was if they found out that there was a well in their neighborhood that had high levels of arsenic. So it sounds like you, you're you already following that pattern. So that's great to hear. Okay. Uh, so um, I'm getting an email from uh, Rich Deepintima. He would like me to unmute him. Rich, are you 44097? I think that's him. So allow to talk. You should be allowed to talk. He's on a phone, though, so... If he's the 3804, he's muted. Yeah. Like on, not on your end. I think he's muted on his end. Yeah, has to unmute. Yeah. Do people know how you unmute on the phone when you're on Zoom? <laughs> there's a, right. I think it's like a star two or something. Okay, Liz just wrote hit one or two on his end when on Zoom. <laughs> hit one or two on, on your end on Zoom there. One or two on your phone, Rich. Give it a shot. I'll talk. Maybe he's the other phone number. No, oh, star it's six. Star six. <laughs> try star six, Rich. Try to unmute the other number. I did. It's it. They both. They're both unmuted. Okay. Well. All right. We'll have to. Sorry, Rich. Have to, have to circle back with yeah. you, Rich. If you can. I'm I'm seeing your emails here, Rich. If you want to ask a question in an email, I can uh, try to uh, pass that on. Um, he, he basically, can you unmute me? I have some comments. Right. Well, sometimes. 
All right. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully he can email them to Brian or we can figure it out and yep. let him talk later. Yeah. yeah. Kind of question mark. Yeah, for sure. Go ahead. I Lisa. don't want to push forward, but I do have a couple of questions about the work that you've been doing. Do I need to come up to the mic? Um, yeah, Jenna, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, my name is Lisa Cote. I'm a hydrogeologist. Um, I'm a couple of questions about the PFAS data in your study. I'm wondering why the parameter list for PFAS was limited to four uh, and not a full suite of PFAS uh, parameter uh, um, cogeners. And I'm curious about the way you presented the PFAS data. You've only provided information about the number of wells where exceedances of New Hampshire data was found, you did not provide kind of a full uh, picture of where the other wells, were all the other wells non-detect, um, where, what were the findings of those? What were the findings spatially in those communities? So that seems to just beg a lot of questions. And then um, lastly, it seems like all of the towns that you've studied are south of Great Bay. And what are your plans to address communities on uh, the other communities here in the Seacoast area? This is drinking water commission. I guess Brandon's going right. to answer this one. So, so I can answer it. As far as the choice to only sample for the four PFAS, the, the trust fund's actually paying for everything but PFAS. And we had to scour up funds for PFAS and it limited the, the, the cost to only do the four parameters. And so for a bunch of wells in Seacoast not presented tonight, we did do the full suite around the contamination sites and with the aquarium sampling. And so I, I mean, I know you have your email, I can send you the GIS file and you can look at the distribution and the other analytes um, yourself. Amy's presentation was meant to be very high level and not yeah. meant to be for the, paper yet. <laughs> the, the lay, necessarily the lay person and show out, you know, show the distribution of concentrations and the different analytes and what co-occurs and what doesn't co-occur. So, I mean, that, that's something for others to work on. And Amy, she's working with private well owners and trying to, I mean, everything you just mentioned is really important, but just doing what we did here is move the mark such a with no no argument and no i don't mean any you know to to criticize at all i just think it could present a false sense of security if you're only presenting oh of all the wells we sampled we only had a handful that were above standards well but we only sampled for four parameters and we're not telling you where all the other where all the other wells sat on that spectrum of detect versus non detect and so it just kind of seems to me all, like, all the well owners got their results. So well, even no, though it's a the... community of presentation, I'm like, okay, well, great. You know, we sampled all these wells and only a handful of them were above for PFAS. That's great. But when you understand the limited nature of that study, the sense of security one might glean from it is different. I agree with you. And we probably need to have not just me blurred out. There's a lot more data than what you're seeing here. That should be on the slides with the PFAS results because the other sampling is biased towards contamination. So the incurrence sure. information shoots way up. So, but that's that's probably another project for someone, uh, one of our hydrogeologists to process the PFAS in the way you mentioned, but your points are, are well taken that the occurrence is much more dire than what the study showed. And that's because these aren't skewed near contamination sites. And I think many people with the contaminated wells didn't have, you know, my wells already sampled. You know, they probably didn't think about the, the missing arsenic or whatever. So they probably chose not to go participate in this. So yeah, that those are all good points. And I don't want that perspective to be lost at all because it's important that the state show our situation mm -hmm. um, relative to PFAS impacts. Is this something the Drinking Water Commission could present on more in depth at a future meeting to dive a little deeper into some of the points well, that Lisa We could just pull all PFAS data for the Seacoast towns and, and present that. Mm -hmm. And we, we've kind of done that in our town by town presentations uh, we did early on. Um, we used our, before this project, we kind of presented occurrence information for PFAS, um, but no, we should have a PFAS centric presentation. Um, arsenic as well, but PFAS shouldn't be there. So um, that's something that's important to show where it's more likely than not, although it could be anywhere given all the sources. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you.
there anything else that we just when oh, other the, communities are going to be get get to participate well, we hope that this project is looked upon as a success by the legislature and the Seacoast Commission will develop a report to, to the trust fund. And there's a lot of legislators on there. And we're hoping that this will be taken statewide and permanently funded so that for years to come, you know, we'll have to, won't be everyone at one time, but there'll be a funding source to help sample private wells. That's statewide oh. is our hope. But right now there are no resources available especially for traditional contaminants. Most of our surge in funding is for PFAS or other emerging contaminants. So there is a need for the long-term to address that. I, I, I pulled up, you know, it's it's also, Lisa, it's the, the members of the commission. So these are the towns that are part of the commission. So that's, you know, part of it as well. Um, you know, that's, that's why, so I think- There hasn't been outreach to Dover yet. Oh yeah, is 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 Dover on the list, Amy? Yes, they're going to be they're going to be last. They're going to be likely in about uh, mid February, maybe early March. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so, <laughs> Rich Deep and Tema, I'm going to read his email that he sent to me. Fortunately, that, that Rich, this did work. So I know you're out there listening to us at least. So, um says, Brian, arsenic has been found in groundwater in areas where there was a historic pesticide application. I think uh, Lisa mentioned that using pesticides containing arsenic, usually potato farms. Is there dermal absorption of arsenic through bathing with water containing higher levels? That's his question. Um, and also irrigation wells with arsenic can have arsenic retained in the soil and absorbed by plants in small amounts. So, thank you. Same question. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. All right. All right. We're probably gonna move on here. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Brandon. Really appreciate your presentations and um, comments tonight. Thank you so much. Brandon yeah. will then stick around if he wants, but doesn't have to. Thank You're you. welcome. I always hit the road. And same with you, Amy. You're welcome. I'll see you later. We thank really you. appreciate it. See you at a next commission meeting, I guess. Absolutely. Great. Thanks. All right, so next up on the agenda is uh, the water update and my sharing screen, slide show from beginning, there we go. All right, so as I have done um, at previous meetings, I, I do want to add that Al Pratt is here at this meeting because uh, he's He's sitting in for Mason, who uh, had a procedure today, but I do see Mason. I'm not going to promote you to panelist Mason, because uh, I know you said you may may or may not, uh, you know, be a little bit under the weather from your procedure. So I hope you're doing well, Mason, and glad you're out there listening. Um, so anyway, Mason did help provide some of the info that I've got for this update, as did Al and others. Um, you know, first off, um, we are wet, so... <laughs> If anybody's paid attention to the weather the last three months, um, we are in a wet cycle. Um, that's good with respect to what it's been like um, in years past when I give these updates and it's still, you know, been dry. So this is a 12 month rolling um, average. So it sort of takes you through August of this year and last year, September through December. So 12 months rolling, which is really how we look at it for what the water system sees. Um, so currently we're at 50 inches of uh, precipitation, which five inches above normal, but we just got a three inch rainfall the other night. Um, and uh, we're at five inches so far in September. So we'll see what happens for the next week or so. So September as well will be higher. Um, so all that, you know, bodes pretty well for the system. Um, with respect to uh, water levels. So this shows you um, our tracking at the reservoir and you can see the three, the two uh, major droughts, 16 and 20. And then the, the brief one that occurred in uh, 21, 22, um, but we are water still flowing over the dam. So, which is very rare for August, September. 
Um, as you can see, some of these previous months, it did dip below, which is, is really normal. It's usually like 4th of July when water stops flowing at the dam and then it'll periodically come up and down until about October. Um, but here's the story here in, in graph graphical detail. So look at the uh, April through um, September averages um, and uh, what kind of rainfall we get during the summer periods. And no surprise, those water levels in the reservoir pretty much mimic what we really received. Um, the 2016 drought, we got half of normal rain. Uh, the 2020 drought, very close to that. So again, you know, 2020 was very close to that. Um, and this summer has been a wet one. It was semi-dry last year. So we were watching things um, as this year came upon us because, uh, you know, always tracking, um, you're only as good as your, your latest uh, rainfall to some degree. So um, everything in our source of supply, I think Al said at most, we were using about 50% of our supply this summer. Um, you know, our water demands are also down when it's raining. People don't need that much water for irrigation. And, uh, you know, we're able to recover um, groundwater um, in our systems. Uh, project wise, we're proceeding with Collins Well. Um, our consultant submitted a report to DES and Brandon staff, and we're in process of uh, um, having them review that and working on, uh, you know, responses to uh, some questions they have to cl clarify things. Um, and once we get everything squared away with this well number two, which is right here where the well rig is standing, the well number one is um, in the building um, adjacent there, and we'll be designing for construction of the pumps and the pipelines to follow. Um, and speaking of pipelines, we have our Little Bay Transmission Main Project, which I've periodically reported on here. Um, we put it out to bid um, and got bids in the day after uh, Labor Day. Um, an engineer's estimate at last um, when the the project went out was not about 8.8 .8 million and the bid we got one bidder 26 million so uh, we had to reject that bid because that was far above what we wanted to pay should pay or uh, realistically need to pay um the the word is we got a lot of interest from the uh the contractors so it wasn't a lack of interest so we we had eight I believe it was eight different contractors. Five of them were like specialty contracts. So this is specialty work to do this kind of work underwater across the bay, 3,200 feet to cross with a pipe. And um, so there was really good interest, good turnout, lots of questions to our engineer and, and that Al answered as well. So we had two addendums out um, in response to those questions. They really honed in on, um, not so much means and methods, the window of time that we would have to construct this. So given that it's in the Little Bay and in the aquatic environment, um, our permits only allowed a November 15th to March 15th in water work schedule. And basically all the contractors said, that's almost not achievable. Um, we, we need a bigger window. We need, you know, are you going to do one season on one side of the water, the other season on the other? So um, we're in process of, you know, revisiting those comments. We'll work with the regulators to see if we can get a larger window of time um, and we'll likely rebid it early next year to get, you know, new bids in. Uh, but in the meantime, we're working on numerous contingency plans um, and that they, they include uh, replacing the valves that don't work on the two lines that still exist there. Um, we've explored just about every other option. I mean, you can, you know, people said, why not directional drill? Why not pipe split? You know, we've looked at all that stuff. Um, the, the pipe that is actually exists in the bay is called ball and socket. So it actually has this collar that you know, isn't going to be able to insert another pipe through it, but there could be, you know, some liners that might be able to fit in there, but you can't do that unless you have a way to shut the water off and get to the pipe. So that's where we're at on that project and to be continued. Yeah. 
and I've turned it over to Al to, to, <laughs> to be the PM sure. since <laughs> we're going on year number eight. <laughs> It will happen under my watch, right? Um, the other pipeline of the Little Bay is the emergency interconnection with Dover. Um, this project is, uh, I believe, getting bids uh, tomorrow. Um, maybe maybe Jim's aware of that. It's a DOT project. Um, and uh, the, the pipe, the bridge is the bike pedestrian bridge that's going in um, to replace the General Sullivan. And we've been working with DOT and um, also Groundwater Commission and through Brandon DES to, um, you know, get some funds for design, number one. But then uh, we submitted with Dover um, to get monies to actually pay for the, the pipe and the connection between us and Dover. And we've got three and a half million dollars um, of congressional monies through uh, Senator Shaheen's much appreciated, which should cover... Um, half of the cost, um, but it's enough money to get the pipe on the bridge when the bridge gets built. So that's the biggie because nothing worse than getting all three of those bridges built and there's no pipe there to eventually connect to. Um, so we're working on that and uh, we'll see what tomorrow brings on, on the pricing there. Um, I know the latest estimate was, was quite a bit higher on what they expect the cost to be. Um, since Al's here, you can tell us where we're at with the, our next acquisition by the reservoir, but uh, we're, we're closing in. Yeah, it's, it's a long process to take the conservation easement. This one has been going on for over a year now, but we do have a lot of funds um, through, uh, potentially through the congressionally directed spending. who's gonna help cover that. We also have uh, some funds through the Creaking Rotter Groundwater Trust Fund, um, which has helped. We're at the point now where we have a contract with uh, Southeast Land Trust in place to do the due diligence, the survey, drafting of the easement to move that forward. So we're hopeful by early next year, we'll have an easement on this property down the corner there. Number four. Incredible property, because you see a lot of shore shoreline right along yeah. the reservoir. Um, highly developable along Hayes Road and Newt Road. Um, I think we calculated uh, 11 lots maybe 11 something like that lots that could go in there um if it was developed so it's it's great and the property owner has been fantastic to work with and is excited to protect her land so mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> uh a little bit um covered up here in this screen but i think um, everybody on the outside world can see full screen um so this saturday speaking so the source protection preserving land the other is you know best management practices for people uh, if people aren't aware, Household Hazardous Waste Day that we hold two times a year in the spring and the fall um, is this Saturday at Public Works. So if you've got household hazardous waste or Great people event. out there, stop by. And other communities are invited. Because, well. Yes, Greenland and Newington are a part of this. So uh, day two, um, those residents and our Stormwater crew, uh, Dan and Chris, are there to greet people, get their info. We get a really good turnout, about 300 to 350 people show up. And uh, it's interesting because I was asking Dan about these statistics, because I know we we're talking about participation um, for the groundwater is, is that it's like, I believe, and don't quote me now, I, I, here I was talking to him earlier today, I should have written it down, but I believe it's 20, 25% different people so it's like every time we get about 300 and most people are kind of repeats but then there's 25 percent that are new so i can't confirm that but um so lastly um al um i'll let you speak to the project that just got underway the other day our master plan for the south end of the system yeah so this is a study that's looking at the lafayette tank down on constitution road our big seven and a half million gallon tank down there um looking at ways to improve the water quality within that tank but also looking at pressures in that whole lafayette area because that area is known to have fairly low pressure compared to other parts of town um, so we contracted with haley ward to do that study and as part of that we just recently cleaned all of our storage tanks it was very successful um, cleaning actually a diver going into each of the tanks and vacuum up some of the sediment that was in the tank um, they're also doing this hydraulic assessment using uh, a hydraulic model 
of the system in that part of town to see any ways we could improve the pressure at that south part, Lafayette, Ocean Road, Heritage, Constitution, that area. Um, so, and that goes along with updating our hydraulic model. That's part, part of this project as well, is to make sure our hydraulic model is up to date, that our hydraulic model is used for a lot of developments that, that go in. We're seeing how developments can affect and make sure that they'll get the fire flows that they would need um, when they, they work. So that model over time has been sort of piecemeal updated as needed when developments go in certain parts. We're gonna to try to take a larger uh, point at that and really, really update the whole model as one. Um, so we have fifty thousand dollars to help put towards that um, for this. This that's for this study here. The this was planning study to look at the pressure um, in right. Lafayette Road area. And that, that came from DS. So DS grant. So. It's great to get that. So the total project we've got one hundred fifty thousand. So the, the the city had a hundred put in our budget for it, and uh, we we've been able to piggyback on that and get another fifty thousand, which is how we're able to expand and do the entire system with the hydraulic model update. Um, so another initiative that, um, again, fortunate that uh, commission has some money and, and cooperation from Brandon and DES. If he didn't have enough on his plate, he's willing to take on additional things. Um, so 2006, um, there was a study to look at uh, the entire region and all the water systems and emergency interconnections. And it's really come up um, you know, John Storr of Dover's on the commission. Um, Rye is a, a big representative on the commission that, you know, talking about interconnections, um, Carl McMorrin down in Hampton. And so this has come up numerous times during our meetings and people said, you know, well, gee, and, and I believe David has, has uh, David Muse has been um, part of this as well. Um, gee, you know, what can we do to look at the broader seacoast area as far as, you know, systems cooperating, maybe merging, helping each other out, um, you know, when there's droughts or, or other emergencies in the system. And, um, you know, I was aware of this study. I was around when the 2006 study happened and um, was actually in Al's shoes um, when, when it was occurring. And I made the suggestion that, well, maybe we revisit the study. So then it kind of got some legs and worked with Brandon and Brandon said, yes, we could probably get some money authorized. So right now um, it's out to bid um, for consultants to do this work. So I believe there's 300,000 budgeted, it would be a year. Um, so the proposals are due in here in the next couple of weeks. And then the um, subcommittee um, will review those. Um, and then pick three consultants to interview and then interviews will occur and hopefully by the end of the year we'll have the consultant and then the consultant has a year um, to update the study. So basically what they would do is talk to every water system about their supply, their demand, future projections, and then they would look at um, also revisit, you know, some systems um, have created connections um, between 2006 and now. So they will revisit those. And then they'll also, out of that, um, look at some communities that weren't part of it. You know, like um, you can see it's expanded on that list. In 2006, it had um, those 10 systems and they're adding um, the other um, systems that are a little bit further out, including Epping, Exeter, Madbury. Um, and, um, the smaller community water system. So there's a lot of them in stratum and stuff. So so basically they're gonna bring in that all together. It's not to create one big district or you know suddenly everything becomes a united water system. It's it's to continue, you know, to work on um intermunicipal, you know sharing of, of sources, whether it be crew or technical. Um, and mutual aid, um, kind of like the fire department. So, you know, it's a little, a little bit tougher when you're talking about pipes that are there, but, you know, certainly there are things that, um, you know, can happen and be prepared for, um, you know, such as, you know, temporary connections that could be established in, in an emergency. Um, 
So lastly, water quality reports. So uh, these have been mailed out. They're also up on our city's website. I've had a few comments uh, from people um, and questions and, I, and I'll answer one of the comments that came from David um, to me about um, P um, some of the PFAS data. So uh, we have the three water systems. So our water system, which is Portsmouth, Newington, um, and uh, Greenland, Samurai, uh, everybody gets Portsmouth water, gets a Portsmouth water um, report. Uh, Newcastle, which gets water from us, um, it's totally the Portsmouth water, but Newcastle, half of the island is actually um, the pipes and the operations are run by the town of Newcastle. Um, so they have a separate um, report, uh, very similar to ours, but their data is a little different with respect to the lead uh, sampling because they have to do their own lead testing as well. And then peas. So everybody in peas um, gets a peas water report. Um, and with respect to peas, I know we, we report um, the treated water numbers. And, and David, you had asked about PFBA and why are those, you know, numbers you know, jumping up uh, the 16 parts and the PFBA. So without getting highly technical about PFAS, um, there are many PFAS. Um, I'll, I'll put, do a shout out to Laurel because I got my uh, week the other day. Does anybody read the week? It's a magazine that comes out weekly. Um, they have a full page on toxic forever chemicals, which they now are putting at 12,000. So that number goes up, it goes down, but uh, 12,000 forever chemicals. But Dr. Shader is is quoted in this article, um, which is a good quote. Short term, it's helpful to know what steps people can take to reduce exposure. Um, but, you know, PFAS, you know, we test for the ones that are um, regulated. We test for ones beyond that. Um, that are the most prevalent that have a, a test available. So, the, you know, Andrea will get into this with the PFPRA um, testing. You know, it takes a while for laboratories, especially when they're testing um, and in the low parts per trillion to actually come up with methods that are validated and, and used. Um, so PFBA is a short chain. So I believe it's a three or a four L. Four chain. Yeah. It's a four chain. Um, so... The way to look at PFAS is the shorter the chain, the, the less it bioaccumulates, the more it passes through, you know, people's organs or animals or the environment. Um, it's also why, to some degree, it's kind of more prevalent. Um, the uh, PFAS and PFOA are, are eight chain compounds. So the higher chain, the more, um, you know, bonded those chemicals are and the hard the harder they are to separate. So they stay in your system. So PFBA, and this is really indicative of just any treatment system that treats for a, a PFAS, um, you know, PFBA does eventually come through the filters and, you know, these are the results. So we're averaging 16. So, so the next question is, well, what does this mean? Um, there is no regulatory um, guidance, EPA is working on some health assessments, but Minnesota has come out with, um, uh, in 2022, they put out a health guidance, which put that number at um, seven parts per billion or 7,000 parts per trillion. So, you know, not that it's, it, it's good news that there's only 16, but relative to, you know, perhaps the health, um, you know, that's, that's where they're they're looking at PFBA at the, at the moment, and I think similar to PFPRA, um, you know the short chain compounds again they're more volatile they're, they're what you see more of in the rainfall, um, and just other parameters. Um, so what are we doing uh, overall in response? So that that's the P system. There are um, PFAS detected in our other sources, and currently right now. You know, the, the regulatory guidance is for the New Hampshire regulations. We have um, three wells that are on the border of the four parts, which is kind of the proposed number for EPA, which at the moment they're reviewing comments. And so we don't know 
when their final regulation might um, come out, but we are um, looking at that and we've got two and a half million dollars to go out and put treatment on the Greenland well. So that is a standalone well, um, has hovered around the four to five range on, on PFAS, um, uh, PFOA and PFOS. So um, we're, we're just gonna put uh, carbon treatment on that and um, we expect to get that as soon as Al and I are able to finalize the, uh, the RFP, we'll get that out later this year for construction, hopefully next year. Um, the Portsmouth Columns wells are the other two wells on the southern edge of the Pease Aquifer um, that also have borderline um, four parts per trillion at times on those. So we've approached the Air Force. Um, at present, the Air Force says they don't have regulatory, um, essentially the regulatory tool that says, yeah, we can pay for your design. So we submitted that to them. We're awaiting their official response. So this was their kind of uh, verbal response. And they said, yes, we'll send you a full um, response of why. And then we're prepared ourselves to just go and uh, recommend that we do some preliminary design just our with our own monies. We have monies in our groundwater um, uh, budget. So we would just start doing the design ourselves so that if the regulations do get um, and put in at four, we're, we're ready to go. And then the Air Force can reimburse us for that. Um, and again, you know, similar to the Greenland well, I mean, th these concentrations being at the low, um, you know, borderline four parts per trillion, um, carbon is really gonna be able to treat these wells. Uh, resin isn't, isn't probably uh, needed at that. Um, okay, so the, the last thing, um, free testing for lead uh, for qualified Portsmouth customers. So this was a, a swag res recommendation. So it's great, um, Andrea and uh, Kim were great help on this, Al, and a big shout out to Mason who's done the heavy lifting and Stephanie who helped us um, put this uh, flyer together. It's going to be a mailer um, to our customers. So um, I'll let Al explain a bit more. I know we've explained it a few times in this um, meeting, but you know our, our lead sampling program is prescribed per the regulatory guidance, but it, it doesn't necessarily offer everybody the ability to get a lead test. So go right. ahead. And this is really set up for anybody. And, and then now it's just, it's focused on the residents, not businesses. We could talk about that, whether we wanted to include those in emblem or not, but it's really just for residents of that receive water from the Portsmouth or Peace systems. Um, and yeah, the it doesn't match the typical compliance lead and copper requirements. We're suggesting that they sample where they get their most water, their most get their water from, you know, if it makes sense. So the way that this is gonna work is this flyer will go out there's contact there so they'll be contacting their calling or emailing mason and mason will be able to verify that they actually are customers on our systems and then give them a code and they will have that code they can go to absolute resource associates we've been mason's been doing a good mm -hmm. job coordinating with them where, where they'll have the test kits ready to go and they just need to tell the person at absolute resource associates their name and their code and they'll get the test kit and they may fill the bottle up, bring the water back. There'll be a chain of custody, simple things to fill out, email, contact information. And then the results will be mailed both to us and the customer. And uh, we'll get the invoice and Mason will have to process the invoice. So, so even if you're a Greenland resident, as long as you're a Portsmouth water correct. customer, you can. Yep, yep. Thank you. Yep. So besides families with kids under six, is there a group that you're hoping would participate or anybody and everybody that's concerned about their water but yeah that's a, I, mean, I, I don't know if it's on this or, or the information that goes with it talks about it, especially you know if you have a child under six years old this is very important that you do this you know trying to mm -hmm. make that you know case so you're advertising the schools everybody well. no we haven't i mean that'd be part of what we should do i don't know then you're gonna have everybody uh, to yeah. well and right so there's a limit of 100 samples yeah, we, we, first come we, first we can do 100 yeah <laughs> first come, first serve yeah so 
and and we'll see what the response is too. Yeah. If it's if it's great, then hey, that's that's good. We, we'll when do it more. You you know? When is that? When when are you announcing? Well, that's after tonight's meeting. We're ready to go. I think we have everything in place to get the mailer out. We just need to get to the printer and ready to go. But we wanted to make sure that everybody is good with the way it's going to get rolled out here. And if they have any changes to that, and we're also coordinating the press release, the information that goes out as it happens October 22nd to 29th is National Lead Poisoning Prevention Week. So we're we're kind of marrying that with some information about lead paint and inspections and home story. Excuse me, do we have a model? Has it has a, a public system in New Hampshire ever done anything in this nature before? Anywhere? Rochester, right? We had we we had Sarah <laughs> as a graduate study they did in Rochester where they had um, crowdsourced lead samples and they had put places out through the town where people could go pick up bottles and it was fairly successful from what I what I heard. Um, we have a program on per state law. All schools and child care facilities have to sample every fixture for lead three times. And so we have grants from EPA to pay for that sampling. And there's a statewide contract um, that anyone can access if you're a government entity. It's a uh, $7 a sample. Again, we pay for it for the schools um, and child care facilities, but it's out there for water systems or towns as well. Do you also pay for private schools? I believe so. I'll get back to you on that. Thanks. I think it just got expanded. So in addition to collecting the, the, the address of where the sample is taken, are you collecting like date of building construction? Like do you gather any kind of... We have records on a, a lot of the facilities. So once we know where their, their house is, we can pull out those records up sure. and, uh, and look at the assessor's data as well and dig into it deeper. Once uh, the 100 kits are used, do you know what the cost is if people wanted to do it and pay for it? $25 a sample. <laughs> $25. So, yeah, we have $2,500 in the budget. And How long will this run? Like, if we don't hit the 100, can it go forever? Or is there like an, because, okay, we, it doesn't. carry over, you know, a lot of projects, you know, don't end when our fiscal year ends. So what we do is just carry okay. it over. So we don't have a deadline. Let's say, no, let's say we had 71, so we still have 29 left. Mm -hmm. We would keep that money in reserve. Okay. Yeah. And Brian, the city is required to conduct its own lead sampling. Oh, yeah. We've, so we've gone over that. That's a, that's and there's lots of information from Al and others. Mason did a great job last meeting talking about it. So, yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um. Can we open up to questions, Brian, for your part of the presentation, or do you want me to move on to mine and then do all the questions? Sure. At the end? I mean, we are hitting. All right. Well, a... I only have a couple. Um. Also, I guess before we move on from lead, I didn't know if Kim had anything she wanted to share about lead before oh, we. Uh, just a couple quick updates. Um. We know that we have forty children in Portsmouth that are lead poisoned uh, between the years of 2017 and 2021. And testing rates have dropped significantly. So this is a real problem. Um, there, there was proposed legislation to have um, on school enrollment forms a checkbox just saying my children were tested at ages one and two, which is a state requirement. Um, but there is no consequence if, if parents don't do that. And um, even though that passed the House and the Senate, the governor vetoed it. So we aren't even collecting that information uh, at this point consistently. Um, you know, Portsmouth is a 400 year old city with lots of old housing stock and um, lots of old paint still uh, at the farmer's market. Uh, the health department has uh, presented some educational information to the community about the low testing rates, the, the concerns about children and lead. Uh, and what's really interesting is the number of residents that have come up to the booth to just share their personal stories. And it's not from one area of Portsmouth. It's not even the oldest housing in Portsmouth. It's uh, not connected to any economic status. It's just people come up and say, I wished I'd known this when my children were younger because I had children that had lead poisoning. So it's actually something that's been you know, persistent here and you hear about it. Um, we do have um, some maps that show areas of concentration in the city. 
that um, where we've had more children come back as elevated lead levels than others. And my staff and I have walked through those areas and it's a complete mix of housing. Again, you can't put it on any in income level or you can't put it on any uh, specific buildings. It's just a real mix. Um, and our chief building inspector is drafting a rental inspection program and lead inspections will be part of that, um, of those rental inspections. That's it. All right. Thank you very much. I have a, <clears throat> had a question about groundwater way, way back when you were started. Um, sure. And you were talking about the amount of rain we've had, but we also had a, a lot of uh, fire and smoke. Does the, well, does the smoke carry toxins that the rain hmm. brings down? I just... Um, <laughs> That's a very good point. Oh, oh, just, likely. Likely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and that gets in the reservoirs, it gets in the groundwater. Uh, Brandon, state, maybe the, maybe what is it? Um, uh, Hubbard Brook, maybe there. <laughs> talked to Joey, uh, who's kind of the yeah. lead researcher at USGS on water quality issues, and he didn't really think this far away, it would, you would actually be able to measure it. I mean, we can see it, but that it wouldn't be enough to be measurable with the instruments we have. The issues out west that are huge it overwhelms the treatment plant treatment plant has to keep operating because people need water for sanitary reasons and the soot and ash contaminates the pipes for years mm -hmm. um, after the fact and it's like polyaromatic hydrocarbons and things like that um, that you know, that water system tests mm -hmm. for on a regular basis that some systems are struggling when they can't get the pipes clean after the, the fire has been really local and really impact their reservoir mm -hmm. um, and then after the fire, you have the nutrients going in from runoff from extreme rain, and it's just and then you're saying of toxins, and it's just it's a whole chain of events. Yeah. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Just going back to uh, PFBA just for uh, a little while. Wanted to make sure I had the the numbers correct. Um, at P's, we're looking at sixteen parts per trillion or billion. Trillion. Per trillion. trillion. All those numbers are reported. The Minnesota Health Advisory Standard. 7,000. Is 7,000 per parts per trillion. Parts per trillion. So we're not we're not getting confused with parts per trillion. And yeah, I know. Trillion. The numbers get bigger as they get smaller. <laughs> so part, part two is um, uh, PFBA and other short chain chemicals appear. It, it doesn't appear that the filtering system uh, is quite as effective with those chemicals as it might be for the long chain chemicals. So with given the given the fact that there are literally thousands of PFAS chemicals and I think Eurofins might test for 20 of them, uh, we really have no idea, you know, what else maybe out there, you know, in, in terms of testing until some of these panels start actually testing for more chemicals. Um, so I, I guess my, my, my question is, is, you know, to what extent should we be looking at um, if trying to, or, or looking into technology that I guess it would be more capable of filtering out short chain PFAS that may be there, but we don't know it's there because we're not testing for it. I, I defer to our treatment expert right. Al, but <laughs> we, we, we have looked at it uh, you yeah, know, right. to do the triple filter, which is reverse osmosis. Right. Um, you have other issues you run into operationally. Right, if you did yeah, reverse osmosis, you're still, you're not getting rid of the waste stream and you're wasting a lot of water in that process. Now I'm waiting for, I mean, there are companies out there working on new resins all the time. So that's that's the new hope. The resins will just continue to get better. But right now we have what we have. So it, it sounds like there's there's just, there's actually a barrier with the filtering technology at this point too. Yeah, both the resins and the carbon. The PFBA is the one that comes through first and we have PFPEA and that comes through. We haven't seen that come, coming out of the P's system yet. Um, and and a lot of the way that they're managed is by changing the resins out. Once you start seeing breakthrough of certain contaminants, you see where they're headed and you, you change change out the media. Um, as you saw, the those numbers that were on the screen were from 2022. We chased out three of the resin vessels and then PFB disappeared in the in the um, discharge for 
four months, I think. Mm -hmm. And then it's so then it's starting to come in now. We're starting to see PFPA again. Okay. So, but it's part of the operations right now or managing it. Thanks. So so why don't before we why don't we go to the last update and then we can open it up to all the questions just so we make sure we get through the updates and then we can have all, right, all the time left for questions. This is on I just have one more brief update and or two, I guess. Speaking of short chains. <laughs> okay. So we have talked several times in the swag about PFPRA, which is a three carbon chain PFAS that was detected in the tap water through uh, city of Portsmouth tap water. Um, that was part of a, a um, community tap sampling program that was offered by a, a NGO called NRDC, where they worked with community groups to collect tap samples all over the country and <clears throat> test it through urofins who test for 70 PFAS. And uh, so I had sent in a sample back in June of 2021, and that first sample came back with, um, it tested for the 70. It did show some PFAS that we already know are in the system, but one PFAS we didn't know at the time was PFPRA at 35 parts per trillion. Um, I know there were other communities that tested, but particularly Merrimack, New Hampshire also tested and found similar results. I think they found 43 parts per trillion. So that prompted uh, myself and another community member from Merrimack to write a letter to New Hampshire DES and EPA and ask them to do some additional testing to see if we could confirm that result because we had never seen that PFAS before. And um, thankfully, EPA and DES did agree to do some additional testing in March um, of 2022, and they split the sample. And those results came back for at 2.1 parts per trillion um, from Eurofins. Pennsylvania. And then uh, the EPA Office of Research, it came back as non-detect. Uh, so that was a little perplexing to us. And then NRDC was generous to give a fund two more additional samples for the Portsmouth and the Merrimack water um, system. And so in April, I took another sample and sent it to Eurofins for the 70 and PFPRA came back at 13. And I reported that at our last WAG. And then we had just taken a sample in June and um, that came back as non-detect. And I have an asterisk there because in talking with Eurofins, they said that the detection limit for that sample for PFPRA had to be 24.5 parts per trillion because there was an interference from PFPA. Um, so, you know, I if there was anything below 24.5 in our sample, it would show up as non-detect based on how they had to run that sample. So. Um, a little confusing and a bit perplexing for sure, but um, basically the update I wanted to provide was what the final result was back in June and that also Brian, Al, myself um, participated in a call in July with NRDC who funded the, this work, EPA, Office of Research and Development, who did do one of the samples, Eurofins, and New Hampshire DES, Brandon Kernan was there, and his colleague Jennifer Harfman, and we just talked about the results, we talked about you know, some of the challenges with the, the lab and the technology um, and different methods. Um, EPA did confirm that their detection limit for the sample was 10 parts per trillion. So if there was anything less than 10 in that sample, it would have shown up as non-detect where Eurofins found it at 2.1. So um, yeah, I guess got some of the, some of our questions answered, but um, basically, the update I wanted to provide was that, you know, there will be no additional testing at this time. There's no more funding for any additional testing. This isn't a regulated compound. Um, I'm grateful that we have this information and that we know that this contaminant is in our water at what level, I don't really know. Um, and some other important information to share is that EPA did release a tox profile on PFPRA this summer as well. Um, and they did confirm on our call, this is definitely a contaminant that's on their radar. Um, the tox profile, it's about a 50 page document. I did reference it here. It's based on limited um, studies, no human studies, seven animal studies, and they used an uncertainty factor of 300. So again, not a lot of strong data on it. But I think the takeaway message for the broader community is if you are concerned about PFPRA in the tap water in Portsmouth, a reverse osmosis filter is effective in filtering it out. Um, that's certainly not something the city is going to do citywide, but as at an individual level, you can purchase a reverse osmosis filter for your home. Um, you can, there's different types too. Um, so next slide, please. And just, oh, sorry. 
There we go. And then just the last thing I, you know, tried to find some more information to provide for the community on PFPRA. There's not a whole lot, but I did find this Cape Fear public utility resource paper that came out in August. Um, Cape Fear is in North Carolina and they are dealing with a lot of PFAS contamination from the Comores manufacturing plant. They see a lot of short chain PFAS there. And this paper was really helpful in just kind of summarizing that, you know, PFPRA is typically seen, it's a typically seen in manufacturing. Um, it, there is being research conducted on it and they are testing in, you know, people are testing for it in drinking water. Initially, when we had done this program, Eurofins was the only commercial lab doing 70 PFAS and we couldn't find another commercial lab who could test for PFPRA. I know that there is now at least one other commercial lab doing it, Enthalpy. Um, so we're seeing the, you know, we're seeing it evolve and more labs take it on. Um, you know, while tests are available to detect it, there is no approved methodology and challenges have been observed with testing accuracy and repeatability. I think we can absolutely agree that we've seen that here. Um, more studies are needed to assess, assess the health risks. I agree with that. And, um, you know, we, we do see that PFPRA can travel from water to plants leading to a bioaccumulation. So important to know that, and that, you know, there is insufficient data right now to draw conclusions on the impact of PFPRA, um, but definitely something for us to keep, keep on our radar as more information becomes available. And then just the last thing, I'm not looking for a robust discussion on this, but I just wanted to start getting this on everybody's mind as we move into the last quarter of the year is, um, if we, as a SWAG, we are an advisory group, if there's any recommendations we want to make to the city council at the end of the year in 2021, uh, the SWAG put together this list of recommendations. So this is more just to give people some food for thought about things that we could recommend to the city council. I think what makes sense is Brian and I can start drafting some things that seem appropriate based on our meetings over the last two years. And um, you certainly as SWAG members can email us and share any ideas you have on things that we can recommend to the council. And um, we can share the draft <clears throat> and discuss it at our next meeting. And that was it for me. So I think um, the very last thing we'll go to is question uh, questions from the SWAG. Uh, or questions from the SWAG on the presentations that we just had. And, um, and then we'll end it with public comment. So I will open it up if anyone has questions for Brian about what he presented on or Al. Yeah, kind of, um, this is for Brian or, or Brandon. Uh, did either one of you mention earlier that EPA is scheduled to finalize PFAS at four parts per trillion in December? No, their, their recommendation was for they're taking comments, so they haven't. Did I hear something about December? There's supposed to and i hear they're on schedule come out with the final value in december of this year and i'm hearing I think low. Well, i don't know what that means oh okay I so before but probably just dis december 24th probably <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah there you go so what Good does night. that the december announcement what would that represent it would be the actual mcl Brand, brandon can you yeah, step right. up the mic <laughs> thank you <laughs> It would be the final um, value that they're adopting and that we would have two to three years to implement so to make our own regulations and require compliance. And uh, let me tell you, it's a half a billion dollars worth of treatment in New Hampshire for just water systems, never mind the private wells. Sure. Um, hundreds of new systems will be in violation. In fact, we're working on a scope of work for Southern New Hampshire, where between Londonderry and Plastel and Pelham and Wyndham, there's hundreds of small community water systems that would exceed. Yeah. We're trying to see where consolidation versus putting a bunch of treatment systems in would be more feasible. Okay. So you expect EPA to finalize PFAS at four in December. Very low, I'm guessing four. I Maybe don't know. Okay, so. No, it can't be lower. They don't think you can find it lower than right. four. So okay. it's going to be four or higher. All right. And then after that, it goes, it will have to go through um, uh, state legislature rulemaking for it to become law in New Hampshire. Um, yeah, we would have to adopt rules, but we pretty much have to because we have primacy. So it, it would be a given at, at a minimum, we have to adopt the federal standard. Okay. All it's right. up to us if we want to have more stringent standard. It's more than just a number. It's how often you sample, how do you verify, what's the response time? To, so there's a lot of things in there that we could customize beyond what EPA has. I see. Okay. Interesting. All right. 
Thanks. Given the cost of remediation of all this stuff and the success of some former lawsuits against large corporations, is there any discussions about lawsuits to get this cost of this covered by the manufacturers? Yeah. There is. There's there's some class action, but I believe New Hampshire, <laughs> Brandon. Yeah. I, Thanks for coming, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I can't really elaborate too much. This falls in the Department of Justice, and I support them, so I, we're very much not the lead. But where it's at is uh, the state of New Hampshire has filed multiple suits against the manufacturers of, of PFAS, and that's ongoing. What's a little confusing, and I don't know if Portsmouth has received such a letter or not, is there are some class action settlements um, nationally with DuPont and 3M, so they're both separate. <clears throat> and they've all been, Water Systems have been receiving certified letters saying you have X amount of time to make a claim. They can, in New Hampshire, their water systems cannot make the claim because when the state filed suit, they filed it on behalf of the water systems, just like MTBE. And so the state is now assessing these settlements on and if they would be enough to compensate us to mitigate for just the public water systems, never mind all the other natural resource private well impacts. And so that assessment's going on right now. And okay. there's a attorney I can refer people to if the water system wants talk in more detail with, with, with their situation thank you we we also have a, a complicating factor in the legislature in that uh unless the legislature directs uh in a very specific way how the money will be spent it will get transferred to the general fund which happened to a 25 million dollar pfas settlement in 2022 instead of actually going to mitigate uh the damage you know uh uh, from uh, from PFAS contamination or help people who are harmed by it, uh, it actually went to pay for new snow plows and paper for the copying machines and things like that. So, I've actually filed a bill uh, that would that would require uh, any funds that are um, uh, that are are to come to New Hampshire in in that kind of a settlement that haven't already been specifically allocated and directed by the legislature to go into a trust fund or escrow account. I'm, I'm leaving that up to the drafting attorneys. Uh, but but the idea is, is uh, as some of these lawsuits start to settle, we won't have another situation where we have a big settlement come in, but because the legislature hasn't directed uh, how the money should be allocated, you know, it would it would actually go to pay for a zillion other things. Yeah, good good point. But I I believe fortunately, you know, the MTBE sell, settlement did go into the drinking water yeah, groundwater yeah, trust. We should have a sidebar meeting because I don't yeah. I understand things to be completely different. Um, in fact, the law's already been changed to say any monies we receive from PFAS lawsuits go to the drinking water groundwater yes. trust fund. Yes, that change is there. And surplus money was used for PFAS funding the rebate program. It's funding the private well sampling program. It's funding the PFAS remediation loan grant and loan program for surplus money and ARPA money. So the state has taken a lot of discretionary funds and put it towards water. I'm not aware of any groundwater money that's being used, being diverted. If anything, the legislature has proven to be very strong in protecting those. Well, funds. part of it is sometimes we, we're just not in a position to know when the settlement is coming. So for something like PCB, uh, we, you know, we had no idea. I mean, we found out that uh, that a settlement had been reached with Monsanto when we read the same news articles as everybody else. Um, and then in terms of, uh, and I don't think anybody really understood that we needed to actually direct that money or it would actually get put into the general fund. I think what we're, you know, what we're not trying to do is to, to, to change uh, the way anything, you know, so for instance, any anything that would actually come specifically for PFAS uh, remediation does go to the, the 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 groundwater and drinking water trust fund, but what what I what I think we're trying to do is to prevent anything else like PCB from just slipping slipping into the cracks because we're basically living in a time when we're just going to see more and more of these lawsuits, more and more of these actions. Um, and it's just gonna be very difficult to track them all. And it's important that when 
we get money because people have been harmed by contamination. We actually spend the money on helping the people who've been harmed and on remediating the contamination. So I think that that's really that that's really what what this would do is just make sure that that's what happens. Could I follow up? Um, I think a really important piece of the remediation, though, is the absolute destruction of these compounds. Mm -hmm. We might be treating it, removing it from our residents, you know, risk. But then if it's just going to a landfill somewhere, somewhere down the line, it's probably just going to become somebody else's problem. So I just really think the approach this needs to be um, to clean it up. It really gets cleaned up. It gets destroyed. In, in, in at Pease right now, there's an issue. There's a uh, there's a group that wants to build a uh, a new fuel mm -hmm. uh, refueling terminal over there, and part of the plan actually includes as they're digging out the foundations for the buildings, you can't actually remove that contaminated soil from Pease. So it's actually going to sort of sit in piles over there after having been disturbed. So, you know, one of the part, one of the things I know that DES is looking at, and there are other folks who are looking into it, is what's actually in that soil, what is the plan for, for you know, for transporting it over into that area, how do you actually minimize any, any PFAS compounds that might be in the soil from, from, from getting out. But the point is, is there's, doesn't appear to be anywhere to take it. Uh, so it it and basically they can't take it off the base where where they would lose track of where it is. So I mean, uh, we're still at a point. I, I mean, I I had a a neighbor when we were I was taking my recyclables up last last year, and she's holding she's holding uh, two two uh, nonstick pans, and she goes, you know, the 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 coating is flaking off of these things things like crazy. What do I do with these? Do I put them in my recycle bin? You know, do I do I put them in the trash? You know, what what do I do with them? And, and the answer is, put them in the trash, which basically means they're going to a landfill. You know, and we we just keep this whole cycle going. So you're, it's a great point. So yeah. I did notice, uh, Elizabeth, you had your hand up, but it went down. So if you did have a question you can put your hand back up or unmute there you go i yes so i i have a question about a separate topic so i don't know if anybody else has questions on this topic still um i have a few questions for brian about your presentation so um if we could do those first liz if we could ask the questions about the presentations and then we can get to your question after yeah my question was somewhat towards the presentation um it was about the um um, the the rainwater and um, the numbers that are the projections that are coming in. Um, I understand that um, you know we are getting a lot of rain next week, and you know there are these issues of flash flooding and whatnot. And so I guess I was curious how the um, flash flooding plays into. I know you've talked about it briefly before, but how it plays into um, uh, contaminants. I know that there's um, a when there's flash flooding, there's usually a rush of, um, of water it can push contaminants through, and there can be more contaminants when there are flash flooding points versus um, just you know general rainwater. So um, I, I guess I, I was just curious if you had any comments on that. Um, you know, as we see in further rainwater. That's a great question. Al Al will provide details. <laughs> <laughs> He's here to answer that question. But um, <laughs> for the wells, um, all that water, you know, pretty much is good for a well. So, um, like I said, our water levels in the wells are good, but we do have surface water, which at times becomes a challenge because we get a a flush of stuff, but we adjust. And yeah, we're seeing that now at the Bellamy. Just this last rain that we had, the water is overtopping the whole dam now. Like it. Sometimes does in April when they get lots of flow. Um, the Bellamy in particular is it's, a, it's an old river, so it flushes out very quickly. So when you do have these large storms, it, it basically flushes from the watershed through the reservoir within a matter of weeks, generally. Um, so yeah, there may be some, but we want to look at more developed areas. That's when you're talking about uh, like flash flooding contaminants, areas that may have gas stations and things like that, where you have contaminants sitting on the pavement and all of a sudden you get the rain and that washes down the drain and ends up someplace. Um, fortunately, all of our sources are fairly away from direct discharges of that kind of thing. Direct you know, discharges are going 
more towards the bay, towards uh, um, surface nice. water systems instead of into our recharge areas of our wells. So we're fairly well protected from that kind of thing as far as our wells are concerned. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the Little Bay project and the qu the quote that was so high. Um, two parts. Is that a shared cost project? Is there anyone that's going to share that cost with us? Okay. So that's all Portsmouth? That will... Well, yeah, all of our customers, which right. isn't Pierce. just the city. So okay. we have customers in Greenland, Newington. Okay. Water customers. Okay. And then are there any state funds or congressional funds or anything uh, that we can have, help? We have 600000 from us. Representative Pappas. Um, okay. We asked for more on that one, and we got six hundred, which we're we're glad to have. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, at, at the moment, we've got to get a reasonable right bid. And Al and I and our consultants and various other people are working on you know those options. Mm -hmm. And that bid was really you know, that bid was put in mostly to say that they're interested in the project, but. It was, I think they knew it was a ridiculously high number anyway, but just to let us know that they're interested in the project when it comes again. Yeah. And in terms of that window that you were talking about, I think it was like November to April or something. So in March, it, March was D E D E S set that or like why? Yeah, we, we, we have seven or eight different permits that we're acquiring and it's mostly related to um, the spawning and the fisheries and, you know, the aquatic. Um, so that's that th those windows, you know, there's less activity and they're not spawning in the winter. So, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. so that's, that's basically it. Okay. Um, in terms of the PFBA at Pease, so what will trigger a filter change at Pease? Because I know that there have been different phases of putting filters online and, and things like that. So, you know, so uh, has there been a conversation with the Air Force because they're the ones paying for it to say like, you know, I mean, are, what what level will we let PFBA get to before we say, hey, we want this changed out. We don't, you know, and I understand that it's not regulated. So we're also looking to, you know, so this this is a, a question we've had with the regulations and you know brandon will have to deal with this as will every state <laughs> you know everybody in the country you know so oftentimes a regulation will come out and you have the right re regulation that you you can't exceed or it's a rolling average or whatever um but you know what what's the trigger level so oftentimes you you have a trigger level i i think arsenic is is the best example here, because there are people that, you know, have wells or small, a lot of small water systems have to treat for arsenic. And uh, basically they monitor and, and the same thing will happen with arsenic. You initially are able to absorb a lot in your treatment. And then over time it starts passing through again. And when it reaches a limit, there's a, a trigger to change it out. Mm -hmm. So We've asked that question, Merrimax asking that question, anybody that puts treatment on, what is the guidance uh, mm -hmm. for the change out? So that'll be a big thing that the EPA is going to have to address. And, uh, you know, when they get all these systems that um, exceed um, and the most recent, so they're in the process of doing UCMR5, which is a more comprehensive sampling of all the bigger water systems throughout the country. Um, and... Right now, that's I believe the number is eight percent exceed the four. So, um, it's you know it'll be a lot of systems all at once. Mm -hmm. So we we don't know how they're going to phase it. Whether you know they're generally when they pass a regulation, they do um, have a period of time where you can you know you have time to to do your study and mm -hmm. design and get the treatment on. Right, but where PFPA is not on, it's not a proposed. PFAS. Well, so it's not regulated, you know, like what position is, is it of the city? Like, is there a trigger level of the city? Like, it sounds like there is no guidance on PFBA as far as I know. Well, so, we, that's why we looked at, you know, what is out there in Minnesota. So okay. I mean, it, it is orders of magnitude higher. Sure. Than right. So, see. right. So it just, it feels very ambiguous to me, I guess, like I understand. Okay. So would we let PFBA get to 7,000 before 
Portsmouth would or Pease, you know, Portsmouth would ask the Air Force to change out the filters so, at Pease. Al, you can answer this. So what happens is it filters out initially because it's fresh um, filter. And then the 16 is about what's coming in. So right. it's what's very interesting how that happens. Yeah, yeah I think uh, you don't have to check what the, the raw levels are. Um, I think they might be around 40. That's a guess right now, but much lower than the 7,000. So even the raw mm -hmm. water doesn't have that level. Um, <laughs> and I, I'm drawing from memory, so I could be slightly off, but I believe Merrimack seeing more PFBA in the finished water than the raw water that's coming off the filter as it ages at times, um, at, at certain points in the life cycle of the filter. And I believe their approach is you know, they, they had a balanced cost. You can't change out the rent or they only have carbon. You can't change that out every week or every month. It's just not practical, but they have some criteria where um, we're going to use the filters for at least this long. I forget if it's a year or whatever. And then if certain non-regulated contaminants are at a level after a year, we will change it out. So it's a way of okay. sort of having the cost consideration as well as mm -hmm. addressing the unknown mm -hmm. impact of having it in the water. Okay. And I, I could ask Tom Preventure for that criteria. Okay. Yeah. And I didn't know if there was any conversations with the Air Force about that too. Um, there, there is. We're, we've been... Like the frequency of the change outs and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. So far they, they've, you know, been very cooperative. I mean, we're also doing, as everybody saw when they visited our, our Pease plant, um, you know, we have pilot system going too. So like Al mentioned that the resins, you know, keep there's new types of resins, which are the filter media. Um, so when we get approached by people or we work with our consultant, we're right now, we're looking at three different and our concurrent one. Um, we did switch to a different type of resin the second round when we uh, did the replacement this year. And it is doing a little bit better performance wise. There's, there's a lot of stuff you know, you're filtering. So there's things that you're not trying to filter out that are there that cause mm. the filters to start being impacted. Mm. So the change outs are operationally more so than, than even the PFAS. Mm -hmm. um, the resins and the carbon treat the PFAS. You just, you know, start running into other issues that operationally you need to change out. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I could just to elaborate on the criteria for change out um, a better analogy for us is arsenic i don't have an example of this with pfas but the compliance is based on the running four quarter average not just one result and there are portsmouth is very protective of its water quality they go above and beyond all things water quality there are some systems that resent some of the regulations don't buy into them and well wait until the third quarter before they change out their filter media. They figured out how to change it out just to stay under mm -hmm. the MCL. And so that's not even close to what, what yeah. Portsmouth does. They, they change it out before they even have detections of what we regulate. So I just, but there are other yeah, yeah. No, for sure. opinions in the state with other water systems. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think my last question was regarding the master plan. Just trying to look at my notes. Um, I was just curious about, so is the master plan that you talked about tonight, like it's not a 10-year master plan, right? It's components of, I guess I just want to clarify that because it was like specific areas focused on Lafayette and certain parts of town. And, but then there's this hydraulic model that will apply to the whole town. Right. So, um, how, yeah, how, how does that work into like a longer term 10 year type master plan? What you presented on tonight? The 10 year is a rolling, just like the rainfall. <laughs> so we're looking out, our capital program goes six years. So we're always looking out six years on those things. Um, you know, water demand, water rates, where you're annually revisiting. Um, and so I think I've reported here, our water demands are not going up. Um, they're holding fairly steady, even though we are getting redevelopment. Um, but uh, yeah, this, the hydraulic model was last done 10 years ago. So that that's a biggie. So a hydraulic model is essentially showing you where uh, the parts of the system need upgrades. The biggest upgrade that occurred was in the 20 years ago, the master plan said, you know, 
you have deficiencies of water downtown, you know, to be able to fight fires and stuff. So from the Lafayette tank all the way down state street to, you know, the state street saloon, essentially we replaced that water main lock, stock and barrel. And then we had this big fire at state street, which was, um, and we put, we were able to put 10,000 gallons a minute on the fire. And, um, that wouldn't have happened if we didn't follow the recommendations of the master plan. So mm -hmm. we're going to continue to do that. Um, water availability is always the next big issue. And Al and I are working on that constantly. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just going to ask Al, <laughs> those, <laughs> those easements that you had around the Bellamy river, yep. did those expire at some point? No, no, they're forever. Great. They're forever. Thank you. Sure. Um, and Andrew's question about the um, the the window on, in which the the crossing can be made. I guess the regulators have said between November and April is that your window of operation. Was that same restriction put on Eversource when they did their crossing a few years ago? I think they had like a six thousand foot crossing across Great Bay, and I didn't know if they they had to have a similar restriction. Uh, they they had a different it's my understanding because we looked at that um they they had a different construction method they went and oh so did they jet they, plow oh okay so i'm not i'm not sure i'm not so they may have different criteria they may have okay all right okay. just curious i was i was resident of durham when they did that and i know i mean it was a huge group up in town and everything was examined cross-examined triple so, by we're, and we're two minutes we're two minutes over sorry lisa um we, we need to right, open up thanks. and see if uh i know we do have um one person from the general public um rose if if she has any questions and you're lisa you you can jump in as well because well, you're make room for rose if she had questions i had a couple of questions about yeah i have to say if you do raise your hand Anybody with questions? Okay. Uh, the question about the, the window, I know that Eversource did that work in Durham and it was under specific parameters, but they were using the jet plow and I don't know that that's not an option for you guys. No, know. it's not. Um, the other question was, Al, you mentioned in the master plan, some concerns about water quality in the South End. And I was wondering if those are aesthetic parameters or if those are chemical parameters. Actually, taste an odor from the Lafayette tank. The water, since it's such a big tank, through the summertime, a lot of the water that feeds the tank sits at the bottom. It's colder water that comes in. So you have a lot of water sitting on top all summer. This time of year, that side of town might have some taste and odor issues because that's old water that's mixed right, with the tank. Right, right. Um, they don't have circulators in the tank. Yeah, that's going to be part of the study, whether that's the way to go yeah. or make us or build a smaller tank or mm -hmm. a number of things that we can look at. And you mentioned, um, Brian, um, looking to the Air Force for reimbursement of potential treatment for Portsmouth and Collins if EPA numbers uh, show up. Um, I'll wait for the next week. Um, Next, sense here, but um, given the ubiquity of sources of PFOS and the low levels that are being detected, do we have good data that suggests that the Air Force is the? It's it's the, part of the it's called the Southern Well Field. So okay. you have Harrison and Smith that are closer to Haven, right. and then Portsmouth. I think Collins are in the the outer edge. So yes, and all the data shows. That, that that direct connection, yes. Now Greenland Wells, another is not part right. of that. It's, and, and part, it's, yeah. it's you know, we think it's more anthropogenic. <laughs> Greenland has all septic pretty much out there. It's next to the highway, so who knows what past you know activities, fires on the highway, things like that. And all of those we love. Three wells, the concentrations are low enough that a carbon system would be adequate. And, yeah. 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 and we, we operationally, that would, because we have to look into operations. That Pease water treatment facility is taking a lot more staff operationally time than we 
anticipated. We're just learning. And the Air Force, fortunately, is, um, you know, learning and agreeing with what we say we need to, to run the place. But when we first, you know, and we have a, a really good side-by-side -side example, because when we put the two filters on, the two carbon filters for Harrison and Smith, it was just like a wide spot in the pipe. It, it really didn't affect turning the wells on and off and all that. Well, the if you've, you've been in the Pease water facility, there's a lot of valves, there's a lot of pipes, there's a lot of controls. Um, so it takes a lot more adjustment and maintenance and, and that than, you know, so certainly just, you know, putting carbon filters on, you know, Greenland, Portsmouth and Collins, you know, given the levels and given the operational parameters, it, it's, it's definitely the way to go. Could you add resin to Greenland, do you think? Should more contaminants become regulated in the future and like potentially short? Oh, yeah, all the, all the, be easy? When, whenever we design, yeah, everything is designed okay. to be able to be modular. Okay. Yes. Good, good question, though. Yeah. All right. Oh, I see Laurel's hands up. Laurel has her hand up. Yeah, uh, thanks. Yeah, just a quick comment. Um, I think it's great to have the information that you have about PFPRA. There's, a, while Andrew was talking, I took a quick look at the EPA document where they um, summarize the health information, and there's just a lot less study on on that than other PFAS. So um, it's good that you have that sort of early information, and hopefully we'll keep an eye on it. I did go back and look at the 2009 Provisional Health Advisory for PFOA, just to see what their level was at the, that they were considering for a, what's called a reference dose, so sort of the acceptable intake um, that should not be associated with a, a harmful health effect. Um, and that's come down many orders of magnitude since 2009. Um, the 2022 Interim Health Advisories, I think were five orders of magnitude lower. Um, but the level that they were looking at in terms of a reference dose back in 2009 was similar to what the recent PFPRA reference dose is. So I'm not saying it's going to end up being as toxic. Obviously, we there's still a lot that we don't know. But just over the past 14 years, our understanding of PFOA toxicity has come down orders of magnitude. And so it, it's important to keep an eye on what the levels are. And um, I anticipate that there will be more toxicity information coming. Thank you very much, Laurel. All right. With that, I think we can go ahead and conclude the meeting. Right? All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Really nice to see you all. Thank you. Good to see you.